With the recent shift to a free market economy, much has changed in Mongolia. Meat prices have climbed sharply, creating a demand for cheap meat from the Gobi region. Access to weapons and ammunition has become easy, and a recent survey showed that the number of active hunters has increased tenfold. Despite government efforts, limited law enforcement means that poaching has become the number one threat to Mongolia's wildlife. Mongolia has been working to protect rare animals as a responsible international member. We have passed several laws to protect wildlife and their habitat. Often, the national government can do little more than offer an official position. Far from the influence of law enforcement or international agreements, the attitude of the herders that live in Hulan areas and interact with the Hulan becomes particularly critical. But it hasn't been harvested. Usually the poachers take off the hindquarters. Please. You can't see any bullet wounds. It was probably killed last winter. Just driving around, you can see numerous Hulan that have been killed. They've either been shot and left plain, or they've been shot for meat, possibly by herders. Equally likely, or even more likely, by market hunters. It is related to the Mongolian economic situation because the price of meat has doubled recently. Young people from rural areas have contacts in Ulaanbaatar and get the meat here within 24 hours. The procedure is to chase them down on motorcycles, shoot them, prepare the meat, and deliver it in refrigerators. 400 kilograms will be ready by the next day in UB. The process is highly organized, and they have a system for getting through checkpoints. In Ulaanbaatar, it is rare to find Hulan meat being sold in the modern meat markets. But in the open-air markets, there are rumors that Hulan meat is available to people who are willing to buy it. Since selling Hulan meat is illegal, sausages are the most common destination for poached Hulan. In the city, few people are well informed about the status of the Hulan or the ongoing poaching. In the countryside, the situation is more complex. These surveys were conducted to gain a better understanding of how the herders view and interact with Hulan. Probably most of them I've talked to, particularly the older herders, view the Hulan as, as something you don't want to kill. It's uh, supposedly supposed to cause bad luck if you kill a Hulan. But there's also considerable comment that they do are able to outcompete livestock, you know, for the forage that is available. Well, the, the, the attitude of the herders is kind of neutral to slightly positive to the Hulan. They, they all stated, well, they're proud, they have the Hulan, it, it's, a, it's a, a part of Mongolian nature and it should be made sure that the, the animal stays in the nature. Even so, many households reported that they shoot and eat hulan on occasion and that they are aware of organized poaching. Though they don't support poaching, few have any incentive to make a stand against it. The reason for this conflict is because the hulan eat the pasture intended for the livestock in the wintertime. You go, like, like we also did for, for coloring, I mean, you go to the herders and ask them where, where are the hulans. And there are adequate laws to protect Hulan, but there isn't adequate enforcement. The fate of the Shavalsky horse shows how easily a species can disappear, and this may be where the Hulan is headed if the local people view the animals as a detriment rather than a resource. Unchecked poaching is a very serious threat to the Hulan, but it is really just the leading edge of the market economy adopted by Mongolia in the early 1990s. 
Recently, Mongolia has become very urban, with over half of the 2.7 million Mongolians now living in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. After a period of economic stagnation, foreign investment is flowing into mining and other industries, and Mongolians are eagerly anticipating large-scale development and an increased standard of living. This growth will mean new roads, railways, wells, and other infrastructure, as well as mining and privatization of land ownership, all of which will have impacts on the land and its inhabitants, the herders, and the wildlife. So what we really have here is a tenuous population of Huan, which is probably the last sustaining population of Hulan in the world. And we also have a tenuous population of herders. In many ways, their futures depend on each other. Hulan survival is largely dependent on the actions of herders to protect them, and the indefinite future of the herder will be heavily influenced by the government policies and foreign pressure being applied to protect wildlife populations. It's hard to say really what impact that's going to have on the herder because it depends on what sort of program is actually developed. Some people are saying they would like to see more, but then they would also like to utilize them. So, so it becomes a, actually a resource for them. By the end of the study, it was clear to Petra and Dennis that the future of the Hulan is still in question. The wells being drilled in the desert are of little concern if poachers exterminate the Hulan population within the next 10 years. On the other hand, little will be gained if the poaching is stopped but the Hulan habitat is overrun with livestock or fragmented in ways that deprive Hulan of foraging grounds. Seeing Hulan in the wild is a unique experience that speaks of a time before the modern world. It is one of the defining realities of this country, where many people continue to live as all their ancestors did for thousands of years, moving herds from pasture to pasture. Now, both the wildlife and the herders are endangered. Ich bin in der Kette, 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 ich bin in der Kette